This is the R Podcast, episode 12, Using Version Control with R. It's great to be back with another episode of the R Podcast. And um, to say it's been a while would be a gross understatement, but in any event, I am uh, very happy to be back. And um, today I'm excited to be able to talk with all of you about using version control with R, which is, in my opinion, a very important topic, especially as we're in this season about uh, you know reproducible research and reproducible analysis. I think this is one of the kind of the backbones of this whole uh, process in general, and I'm really excited to talk to you about it. So yes, it has been a while. (laughs) In fact, this is the first recording for the year 2013. And, um, you know, back in the previous episode, things were looking pretty good. I had things kind of lined up and then, well, as some people would say, real life got in the way on uh, multiple fronts, Um, combination of work things, family things, and and one thing kind of funny in particular is that the R podcast studio actually was converted into a second nursery for my son. So that kind of put things in a loop for a bit and uh, just some things happening here and there. And then, but the good news is things are looking up now and um, I have solved the issue of the, the studio being converted into a different uh, purpose because now I have, a very nice and very robust uh, new laptop that I'm using to record each of the episodes thereafter. And I want to give a quick shout out to uh, Chris Fisher at the Linux Action Show for his recommendations on the configuration of this new laptop, which uh, not to digress too much further, it's by an awesome vendor called System76. And what's neat about them is they specialize in providing uh, computer hardware, laptops, servers, desktops, etc. that are configured to be directly supported with uh, Linux and Ubuntu in particular. And I've been in the market for a new laptop for a little bit and based on Chris's uh, nice review on this uh, particular brand called the Bonobo Extreme, I decided to take the plunge and and, uh, get this for the main purpose of, you know, recording new episodes of the R podcast, along with having the uh, necessary horsepower under the hood to record new screencasts as well. So now I'm using that right now, and um, hopefully the audio quality will be just as good as it was before. But if you're noticing any um, weird noises along the way or a general decline in quality, as always, please contact me, and I'll have full details of that when we get to the listener feedback. But um, anyway, things are looking good, and let's uh, dive right into it. So let's get to our main topic for today, using version control with R. All right, so let's, let's dive right into talking about version control. And historically, this is uh, something I did not get into personally until... I would say about maybe half a year ago or perhaps even less than that because in from my um, previous uh, understanding of version control, I always thought it was kind of associated with just, you know, development of software or code and, gen, you know, source code making software, you know, for programmers to keep track of what's changing and, and things like that. But it's really interesting is that as of probably about a year, maybe a year and a half ago, I did start to hear people talking about using version control with their uh, R programming, or even you could say statistical programming in general. And I was kind of curious what what all this entailed, and I'm really glad I did because it really opened my eyes to the kind of this new world of thinking about how to make my research reproducible and, you know, really, um, how should I say it, also kind of future-proof things like, 
you know, we don't talk about backups all the time, right? This is a nice way to keep backups of your system, of your code and your projects. And I'll dive right into that in a little bit. But to get a little more precise here, what exactly is version control? Well, you can definitely uh, check out a link to the uh, Wikipedia entry I have in the show notes. But briefly, it's uh, the management of changes to either documents, say computer programs, even websites. You know, you can think of a website like the R Podcast, for example, which is something I should put under version control, which I probably will after this, and other uh, collections of information. So it's really giving you kind of a traceable history from like start until your current stage of what kind of changes you've made to your project that you're working on. And what we'll be talking about uh, focusing today is, of course, the topic of using your R programs under version control. So let's talk about why would you want to do this? Well, what are some of the real benefits you'll get? And really, I, I touched on it uh, earlier is that you will definitely have a backup that you can go back to in case something either goes haywire with your system or perhaps you made a change and it really kind of broke things and you just want to have a reset button to go back to a workable state. Well, version control is going to give you that ability to go back in time, if you will, um, to go back to a working you know, version of your project. Now, that does actually entail something of kind of discipline on your part because version control is only as good as how often you basically record these points in history so that you can go back and have a stable version if things kind of go haywire. So, but another key advantage to version control is that in the situation of a collaborative uh, arrangement, perhaps you're working with a team on projects, well, version control will give the ability to help keep track of who's made what changes to the project itself. And then they'll have a robust way under the hood to merge everybody's changes together so that everybody kind of plays in harmony, so to speak, that you don't have many, you know, really difficult conflicts that you might have if you just tried to do this on your own without the help of version control. And one other key point to me is that as I touched on earlier, it definitely allows you to have a history or even kind of a log of the revisions or changes that are made to the files in a project. And I think this has a lot of implications, not just in the specifics of writing, say, R code for your project, but you can even extend this to like a statistical analysis in general. And this is something I briefly touched upon in the last episode to introduce this uh, season. But I think this has a lot of capabilities to extend to how you approach a statistical analysis from when you start to plan like what methods you're going to use for the analysis, what are your key objectives, and how are you going to you know, summarize the results from your analysis into, say, a finished product. Well, the version control is going to allow you to have the capability of, of course, having that starting point of like when you define all the analyses that you want to run and what are the goals of the project. But then as as you go on with developing the code that's needed for the project and maybe you think of ideas kind of midway through this stream of working on the project, well, version control is going to give you this interesting concept to kind of uh, basically branch off different ideas into their own work streams. And then let's say it turns out to be a really meaningful analysis. You can then merge that in with like how you started things. And this is getting to the concept of branching, which I'll be talking about as we get to the details of this. But I think this is also a great ca capability to give you kind of a traceable history of how you've approached a statistical analysis. And in the concept of reproducible research, I think this is a really important idea because most of the time, let's say you've seen a manuscript on an analysis or uh, maybe a blog post or something like that, and you see basically what the author is giving as maybe what they would call the polished result or the end result, but sometimes they may not post like how they got there. Well, if they were using something like version control, 
then if they have their repository online, and we'll talk about ways of doing that later on, then you might be able to actually go in and see kind of a log of the history of how that project evolved, which could be a fascinating study to see how you might kind of learn from how someone approaches an analysis and how they exactly got from start to finish, where you might not actually get all that all that history, all that context, unless you could see something for, that version control offers um, offers to you with having this kind of history of all the changes made. So I think that's a really innovative concept that I would hope more people over time start to use in their kind of analysis that they put online or, you know, better yet, if they publish a manuscript that they could have an accompanying repository online with the code that was done to do it. And, you know, perhaps they can't share the data on confidentiality. Well, that's okay because I'm not really getting into the reproducibility of everything per se, but at least seeing how the project evolved and some of the issues that they that they had to resolve, whether it's just on the code itself or even in the 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 workflow of the analysis strategy. I think that would be a really fascinating thing to see, kind of a history of that. And version control is going to definitely give you that capability. Now, there are more than one way, or I should say more than one software that's offered to actually let you use version control. And I'm going to talk about one in particular that um, I ain't gotten a lot of attention lately in the R community. And that one is called Git. And that's spelled G-I-T. And Git is really, um, some of the history of Git is, is that if you're familiar with, of course, the uh, Linux operating system, which I've mentioned, you know, having great understanding of in, in my life, I've been able to use Linux at home for a lot of my computing needs, um, both here at home at, as far as my, you know, hobby of interest, and as well as even at work as well. Well, Linux um, has been using version control for a very long time, and the author of Linux just so happens to be the author of Git itself, and that is, of course, Linus Torvalds, of, and he's the author of the Linux kernel. So it's kind of interesting that if you're using Git, you're, you're, you're using the work of the same person that's actually brought Linux uh, to help bring Linux to the world. So I think that's pretty fascinating. And what Git is, is it's been termed a distributed version of, of version control, if you will. And that's in contrast to another major uh, system of version control called Subversion, or SVN for short. That's actually what they call more of a central repository kind of version control scheme. But Git, I think, is a little more robust in terms of what my workflow needs, where Git basically, instead of storing actual copies of files as you revise them, you know, going from start to finish, what it's going to store under the hood is actually just all the changes to those files. And it's going to give each of those changes an associated what's called a kind of a SHA sum. You can think of it as just kind of this random alphanumeric sequence. Well, it's basically kind of this unique identifier to each of those changes. So it's keeping track of all your changes, but not always having to duplicate the original file, but just uh, keeping track of what are all the changes you're making to that code. And then the concept is, is that you'll be working in this, re in this uh, Git repository once you set it up. When you, when you make a change, then Git is going to notice that you've changed a certain file. And the way this works is when you're satisfied with the changes and you want to commit it to the repository so that it knows about these changes, you move it into what's called a staging area. And then once it's in the staging area, then Git knows that this is something that you want to record kind of the history of and record the change to. And you can do this with one file or multiple files at once. It doesn't matter. But the key step after that is that you want to commit to the Git repository the changes you've made. And that's through a concept appropriate enough called commit. 
And when you commit these changes to either one file or a set of files, it's totally up to you, then you can attach to it a message that describes what exactly you're doing. And this is called a commit message. And then you can simply type in, you know, a, a brief summary of what your changes are all about. And then you basically hit the commit button or the commit command, and then you've got it. Now you have a new stage in your analysis that's separate from like where you've begun with this uh, and this commit of the files at this part of the analysis. And this is something that you can always go back to if you encounter any issues in your future changes or things like that. But in a nutshell, that's kind of what Git is all about, is that it's keeping track of these changes to these files, but it is kind of up to you about how you want uh, the, the changes to be recorded in kind of the history of your project. And that's where you have a lot of control over how often you commit these changes and within each of these commits, how many files or set of files were part of that, that change. And so you can, there are, there are a lot of different ways of doing this and there's no right way about it. Some people may not fully commit something until they made a changes to like a whole set of files because it all had an underlying purpose. Some may do a multiple commits, maybe one for each individual file because that's the way they would like the history to reflect. Well, that part's up to you. But the key theme in all this is that Git and version control in general is only as good as how disciplined you are to record these changes because you could have a, a repository initialized for your project. You're working away at it. You have a bunch of these what we'll call unstaged changes, but then if something happens and you didn't commit any of these changes in the overall flow of the repository, then you might not have a place to restore from. And that could be a big problem. And actually, there is a, in, in the current uh, news on the Linux side of things recently, there was an issue where um, a company, or I should say an organization called KDE, almost lost all of their changes to their desktop environment code. But luckily, they got it all restored. But it wasn't a problem to get or anything. But it just, uh, it was an interesting thing because that Git was uh, talked about, about how important it was to record these changes along the way. But anyway, I think um, Git is a very attractive uh, version control system because the flow and how you use it has been really, in essence, uh, made, I would say, fairly easy with a couple of the really popular R integrative development environments. And I'll talk about specifically about how R Studio. Um, uses Git and inter integrates that with the overall scheme. And also another popular IDE called Eclipse offers a version control with Git as well using one of their uh, plugins that you can download for it. But let me now uh, talk about how do you actually get started with Git. And the good news is that it's a fairly easy thing to get set up with. And as I talk about some of these uh, these uh, these uh, commands and various uh, interactions with Git, I will highlight the fact that in our show notes, I will have a link to a very um, interesting uh, textbook that's been made available online as an e-publication free of, tar free of charge, and it's called Pro Git, and I think it's got a really nice overview of kind of how Git works, what you need to do to get started, and of course. It details uh, the concepts of the various commands I'll talk about and the various uh, Git uh, concepts that are unique, such as branching and working with remote repositories, amongst many other topics. So I would definitely recommend to check that that uh, textbook out and that, that free ebook out as you're listening to this episode or perhaps afterwards and you want to learn more. Well, the good news is, is that Git is cross-platform and it's available in every uh, major operating system. You can get it on, on uh, Linux through your favorite uh, package manager, and it's uh, simply search for Git, and then you'll be able to get that installed on your system, no pun intended. Um, on Windows, there's a project called MS, MSysGit, I believe, 
And I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well, where you can set that up on your Windows machine and have a robust installation there. And then there is also an installation available for Mac as well. And I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. So getting Git installed in your system is very straightforward. But now let's talk about how to actually work with it in the context of an R project. So the first step is, of course, you need to initialize a Git repository on your local system with respect to this project you're working on. Now, this is where I highly recommend, as you're starting out with this, having an IDE like RStudio or even Eclipse to kind of get you started with this because it's going to give you a way to do some of these basic commands without having to actually go to the command line itself. But then as you're learning it, you'll you'll be able to use the command line equivalents as a real power user, if you will. Now, what's nice about RStudio is that it has a capability of creating what are called projects, which is basically going to be a directory tailor-made for a specific project of your desire. Well, what's nice is that when you make this project, our studio is going to give you the option of creating a Git repository for that particular project when you create it, or even if you didn't create a repository for a project you've already set up, you'll be able to add a Git repository for that, even if the project is already existing. But it's just a simple click of, of the mouse, if you will, when you create the project, it'll give you an option to basically check the box for creating that Git repository, and as well as for an existing project, being able to add that after the fact. Now, if you want to do this from the command line, this is where I'll start to talk about some basic Git commands it's very easy as well. So what you'll want to do is in your command line prompt, you'll want to navigate to your project directory where all this code is stored and simply run the command git and then init. So that's git space init. All that's going to do is simply initialize a git repository for that project. Now you may wonder what's actually being done with that. Well, if you want to kind of see what Git is making, what you'll see is in that project directory, there's going to be a what's called a hidden directory for that project, and it's going to be appropriate enough called .git. And this is where Git is going to store all their particular files within that repository that are used in the whole Git workflow. And that will be uh, important. You won't really need to go in there very much. But of course, you never want to delete this directory because this is how Git is uh, doing things behind the scenes. But once you once you have this set up, you'll be able, you know, everything will be kind of automized once you get to know the commands for staging and committing your changes. You won't really have to go in that hidden directory much at all. So another interesting concept is by default, Git is going to keep track of changes made to any file that's in that project directory. So that's just the default behavior. Now, there may be a situation where you don't want Git to keep track of those changes. I can think of a couple examples with respect to R and your, your R projects in general. One of which might be if you had, say, a, a, a file in R where you wanted to store some kind of key environmental type variables or constants that you might need for interacting with, say, another package. And a specific example is that up until recently, for my um, project for the NHL analysis that I have on GitHub, and I'll be getting to how that works in a little bit, I had had a script in my lib directory where I had stored my login credentials for the MySQL database that I was interacting with. Well, I didn't want to put that those uh, those uh, login credentials in my actual R script that I have online. But what I did is I put it in this separate R script and I told Git to ignore that file. In other words, don't keep track of it and don't put this online when I go ahead and commit changes to a remote repository. 
So how do you do that? How do you tell Git to ignore certain files or even certain directories? Well, that's where you want to create uh, another what's called hidden file. And this file is called .git ignore. So that's simply .git I-G-N-O-R-E. Now what this is, is simply going to be a, a file that has, you know, a listing of all the files that you don't want Git to keep track of. And what's nice is that you can, you can configure this a lot of ways where you can put specific files themselves, i.e. their specific file names, in this file. You can also put directories in this as well so that then it knows for a certain directory, if it's in this git ignore file, to go ahead and ignore that for any future changes you make in the repository. Now let's talk about what would you want to put in here with respect to a project. Well, within RStudio itself, if you're familiar with the way projects work, it creates a, a set of directories and a set of um, files specific to the project one of which is it has like a project file with the extension .rproj. And that's what RStudio uses to kind of keep track of things as you're working in a project. Well, this is something that frankly is not necessary to have to keep track of in Git because you're not making any changes to it yourself. This is what RStudio is doing. And frankly speaking, it's not really impacting anything you do of a project. So in my files, I go ahead and I ignore this file by putting a line entry for it in the .git ignore file. And then there may be some other files you don't want in here as well. For example, they also have files, um, you know, for an R project with extension .r history, which of course is the history of your code as you're working through a project. Now maybe it's something you feel, okay, I want to see, I want to see the changes made to this as we go along. But to me, since I'm not really writing this myself, I'm not as concerned about the history of my code from a file like that as I am just in the overall repository. So I go ahead and I ignore this file as well. And I would say other files you might want to think about ignoring might be actual data files themselves. The reason I say that is that perhaps the data files are quite large. And it may be a situation where you don't ever actually make changes to the source data for your project and which is something I highly recommend. I actually recommend you don't make changes to whatever uh, data file you're using for your project or set of files but instead I would record any changes you make as part of your R session or your R workflow as separate kind of what I'll call munging scripts where you're basically pre-processing the data to get it to where you need to for your R project. So I would go ahead and I would recommend if you have data files in your repository, I would recommend you ignore those those files unless they're, you say, not a huge file size and that's an inter integral part of when you want to share this code online for people to say reproduce your results. Of course, that's a different story. For me, I'm not going to really put any of the data files that I have for say the R, the NHL analysis project I'm working on, I'm not going to put those in the Git repository, but I'll have code in that repository that you can see online, which talks about how to import those data files. And I'll have kind of details of where you have to go to get those data files. And also I, I put in code to do some web scraping to get data from online using that website, hockeyreference.com. Of course, I'm going to have as part of the, the Git repository, the code needed to do that web scraping because that's a, a key part of the reproducibility of it. But you'll notice I'm not putting in the MySQL databases that I'm forming with that data inside because first of all, that would be way too large. And second, that's not necessary from my standpoint as far as sharing this online. What's necessary is, of course, the code I'm making to actually um, produce those files. So again, that's kind of a preference, right? But for me, that's kind of some of my thinking when I thought about what do I, what do I put in version control and what don't I put in there? And the key takeaway is that the .gitignore file 
gives you that customization to get, tell get what you want, what you or I should say, what you don't want to get, to keep track in your repository. Now, what's nice is that that file, if you're making an R Studio project and you have it initialized with a Git repository, that file is automatically created by default. And so you just go ahead and open it up in R Studio itself or your favorite text editor and just uh, populate it with whatever files you want to ignore. Now, if you're doing this strictly from the command line, well, it's quite simple. All you do is, that, of course, you're inside when you're inside the root directory of your project, just create a text file with just simply called .git ignore and go ahead and populate that as you wish. And then that will be taken care of by Git itself. So now let's talk about the concept of staging. Now, I mentioned it in the introduction of, of the topic, but you can think of the staging area as like a holding place for when files that are waiting to be committed to the overall repository. And you can think of it as like if you're shopping and you're in the checkout line, and of course there are people ahead of you, or you're, you can think of it more as just a group of you waiting to get your you know items checked out so you can get on with your life. Well, all of you in that line, you can think of it as like you're in the staging area, and then when the cashier sees you and they check your items out, you know, price it out, you pay them and stuff, that change has been committed, right? Your wallet's a little smaller now because you've, you've bought your items. Well, that's like the process of being committed, if you will. But let's think of the concept of you standing in line like that staging area. And as I mentioned, the staging area can be as big as you want it to be. In other words, you could have multiple files in the staging area. In other words, you made changes to, say, a set of files then Git is going to put all these files in the staging area. And what's nice is, is that let's say you finish making some changes and then now you want to get to that process of putting them, you know, getting checked out, if you will, or putting, getting them ready to be committed to the repository. So what's nice is that RStudio will give you a, a tab inside kind of the upper by default, it's the upper right panel, but you can always rearrange this. You know that the place where you have your workspace, where it gives you all the items in your in your R session, you know, like the objects, like your data frames, your vectors and things like that. Well, there's going to be a tab in addition to the workspace and history tab called Git. And what you'll see if you look at that tab is you'll see in there, there will be a checkbox next to each item that or each file I should say that has had a change since your last commit and if you're just starting this it'll be any changes you made since you initialized the repository so of course if you're working on multiple files then of course that have changes then you'll see multiple files rep, rep reflected in this uh, panel here of all the changes that have been made but you haven't done anything with them yet and by default, those checkboxes are unchecked in this column called staged. But when you want to, say, put this file's changes into the next, the next process of committing it, you would simply check the boxes next to the files that you want to, you know, eventually commit. And maybe it's just a set of files. Maybe it's just one file. It's totally up to you. But when you check that box, then you'll see that there's another column called status where before it had just say a box of question marks. Now there will be a new box with the, the green background with the letter A. What that means is that you've added that to the staging area to be brought to the next level for committing to the repository. So like I said, in our studio, that's quite easy. Um, it just simply use those check boxes to add what you want. Now, from the command line, it's a fairly easy thing to do. We're in that root directory of your project. You're going to type the command git add. So that's two separate words, git and then add, and then a space, and then the name of the file that you want uh, staged, if you will, for the next part of the process. So if you're adding one file called test.txt, for example, it would simply be git add test.txt 
And then let's say you want to add all the files at once that you've had changes to, or add all the files no matter if there was a change or not. Then you'll want to use the command git add and then an asterisk. So an asterisk is what we call a wildcard character. And what that's saying is that, okay, all the files you see here, go ahead and commit and put them in the staging area. You could combine this wildcard with, say, maybe an extension. Maybe you want to commit all the R code files, which, of course, are in the extension .r. You could simply type git add asterisk .r. Then you would simply commit all the R files uh, for the next, since they commit, you'll stage all those files to the next part of the process. Okay, so now they're in the stage, the staging area, and you've marked them as being added. So now the next step is, of course, to commit those changes. Now in R Studio, the nice thing is you'll see a button in that pane called Commit, and you'll simply want to hit that, and then you'll get a new window popping up where it's going to have now all those files that you've staged or even unstaged at this point, and then it'll show, like highlighting what, either one of those files or, or multiple files, on the lower part of the window, you're going to see what's changed since the last version of that file. Now, it may be either what's changed or what's new if that file has not been uh, committed before. In that case, you'll just simply see the, the contents of that file, you know, printed verbatim on that on that uh that area where it's showing the changes to the file then in the upper right you're going to see a box for commit message this is where you would simply type in what message do you want associated with this uh commit to the repository now there there are a lot of different uh, for, uh mindsets for how you you configure these or how you type these commit messages some are very brief. Some might just say fix a typo or things like that, which I think in retrospect may not be the best idea. I think it's good if you take the time to be a little more verbose than maybe you would you know, think you would need to be. Because let's say you're going to this project, say, two years later or, or a long time after you do this first round. Well, you may not have fresh in your mind what the what the changes you made were what was the overall purpose of it so i would definitely take the time to you know put some of your thoughts into this commit message and you know what were the impact of these changes why did you make these changes just so that you yourself have that that history that you can go back to when you read these commit messages at a later time and kind of understand the flow of your project from start to finish if you just have a bunch of commits that said fix syntax error, fix typo, added this, but without any real narrative as to why, you might not get that full history when you go back to this, say, a, a while later. So I think it's it's nice to kind of kind of be a little more verbose here. And there are some nice resources online for kind of best practices for how you configure these commit messages. I would definitely check that out, and then that way you'll, you'll kind of have an idea of what some others are doing, and you may want to adapt either some or all of those uh, techniques for your commit messages. So anyway, let's say you type out your commit message in this box, then the next step is simply hit the button called commit, and then lo and behold, that's going to now um, do the little processing, but then it's going to say you've committed these changes, and now you'll have that history of the uh, of the commit recorded in the overall flow of the project. And if you wanted to kind of see after you committed this, what's the history of this? Well, in our studio, there's a nice drop down for like additional commands. It's under the more button up there and you can hit a button called history or a menu item. And in this way, you'll get a new window pop up where it has the history highlighted at the upper top part. Then you'll see all the commits you made. And all you have to do is just highlight one of these commits and then you'll see then on top of your commit message what were all the changes you made and what files were changed. So looking at my NHL analysis project, 
I had a previous commit back in July, near the end of July, where I added the munging scripts for how I process those hockey summary project data files. And in there, I had about five files that I added there um, for each of the different types of data that I was importing. And then you can see either the changes I made or the things I've deleted. So if you added something, those entries will be highlighted in green. And if you deleted something, it'll be uh, highlighted in pink or red, I think pink more likely. And you'll kind of see with respect to that particular file, what's new and what's changed. So I think it's really nice to see kind of how I've evolved an analysis script, what I've changed and what I've deleted and what I've added. I think it's very really useful. And then it has, of course, my commit message in there as well. And I think, again, that's that's useful to understand kind of the overall big picture of what you've done for the changes. And I think that's a really important concept when we talk about reproducibility. Now, um, it, I think uh, for the command line equivalent, it's uh, quite easy. Um, when you're ready to commit, you just type git space commit and then a space dash m, m is in Mary, and then start a new uh, portion in quotation marks. And then within these quotation marks, just simply type your commit message. So then you simply type that, that commit message within the quote marks and then end it with another quotation mark and hit enter. And there you go, you've now committed the changes. So that is a very brief, but I think the kind of the fundamental rundown of how Git actually works when you're working on a project. And obviously I could go a lot farther into this and I would recommend that if you're interested in seeing kind of a a real illustration of how this works, maybe through a screencast or anything like that, go ahead and send me a, a message. Um, well, I'll, I'll get to how to do that with the listener feedback. Go ahead and send me a comment that you're interested in that, and I'll be glad to kind of show you a working kind of uh, demonstration of how I use Git for my version control needs with respect to our projects. But that is, in short, how you would work with First of all, initializing a repository, telling Git, of course, what not to keep track of, and then the concept of going from, you know, unsaved changes to the staging area, and then from the staging area to actually committing those changes in the repository. That is fundamentally what you will need to do once you're getting started with Git. And then, of course, as you read some of these references I have links to, you, you'll find out that you can do so much more with this that I have I barely scratched the surface of. So um, the next portion I want to talk about before closing out the topic is the concept of remote repositories. Because what I've talked about uh, up to this point is assuming that you're working on your local system. So say with this laptop I have, for example, if I stored all my project files on the laptop, I do a Git repository, it's still local on the laptop itself. Now, of course, that could be a problem if not, you know, hopefully this doesn't happen, but let's say my laptop just completely failed and it had a hard drive problem. Well, unfortunately, then I've lost all the changes, right? So you want to think about, you know, lost everything, basically. So you definitely need a backup strategy in place for your actual repository itself. So there are a few ways of doing this. I'll touch on one way that's kind of, I would say, the easiest to set up, but you don't get a lot of added features with it. And that's the concept of putting, say, your code and along with, of course, its Git repository in one of the online you know, cloud storage mechanisms. And one of the more popular ones is, of course, Dropbox. So what I do actually right now is for my code that's for the R, the R podcast, and hence all my R kind of coding needs, I have that as a directory in my Dropbox. So my Dropbox is backing up, of course, my code itself, as well as, of course, the Git repositories for each of those projects within Dropbox itself, so that if I have a hardware failure, I can always re-download what I did from Dropbox and hopefully have a you know up-to-date backup of it from that. Now that the the only downside of Dropbox is of course 
it's backing up as just like files themselves. It's not a really intuitive interface to really browse a Git repository or things like that. It's just a bare bones way of doing it. So you might also want to think about, you know, backing up to a repository that's specially designed to work with the Git version control system. Two of them come to mind, and there may be others as well, and definitely let me know if I'm missing some. One of which is called GitHub, which is actually what I'm using to share all the files I've made up to this point with uh, the R podcast and all the project files like the NHL analysis, like the code for the ggplot episode, you know, the project uh, template episode, things like that. Another one that I think may be newer, or perhaps it was around at the same time, is called Bitbucket. And I'll have links to both of these in the show notes. Now, you may be wondering, okay, there's two of them, so should I do both? Should I do one or the other? What are the advantages? Well, here's kind of my take on the key differences between them and the advantages. So first, with respect to GitHub, it has become a very popular uh, remote repository for our users around the world. And I'm talking about people that are, say, creating packages, and what they're doing is they're putting all the development code for the package on GitHub, and then, of course, when they have a stable release, of course, those are being submitted to CRAN like usual, but a Git repository gives them a way to keep track of issues that other users are experiencing because other users can simply go ahead and file an issue with, say, a a file in the package repository or just a concept in general and really interact with the developers, or I should say the maintainers of the repository, in a real-time fashion. And that kind of gets to kind of the other advantage of GitHub is it's become a very social way of kind of sharing your code online where it has some really neat features to say follow a particular user's repositories kind of keep track of what they're up to or what changes they're making but from my perspective it it also has a really neat interface for creating documentation around your repository you can even make a separate website for your for your project or say your package using the Git framework, it's really nice and tidy and very handy. And one shining example that I would I would deem is the uh, Knitter package, which has a really nice uh, GitHub repository page and an actual uh, package page that was, you know, coded on GitHub itself, but it's a page within it that really has a nice kind of detailed breakdown of how the package works and everything involved with it. And another nice feature of GitHub is that it gives users around the world the ability to what's called fork a repository to their local system. So a case in point is the author of the Knitter package, uh, Ihui Sia, and I probably butchered his name, forgive me if you're listening. Um, he's created another repository for his upcoming book on using the Knitter package. And it's a really interesting textbook, but he's doing this kind of in the open right now by hosting it on GitHub. Well, I was really interested to see what the book had to say. So all I had to do was simply fork the repository um, of the Knitter book into my GitHub repository. And then that way, all I had to do is just sync that with my local system. And lo and behold, I had the the Knitter uh, book now on my local machine that I can browse at my leisure. So GitHub makes it very easy for you to kind of fork these repositories to to your own um, account and then hence uh, keep track of things and check what they're all about. Now, let's talk about Bitbucket for a second. So Bitbucket is very similar to GitHub. I notice it doesn't quite have all the uh, social type features that GitHub has, but it does have one key feature that might be important for a lot of you. Now, Bitbucket gives you the ability to create a private repository. So in essence, you stored it on Bitbucket, but you won't have any, you won't let any other users be able to see it. That might be important for you, especially if you want to keep things under wraps and it's a confidential thing, but you wanted to keep it backed up somewhere in a remote fashion. Um, That might be a a huge uh, feature for you. Now, I should say GitHub 
does not offer that through their you know free accounts you would have to pay um uh i'm not sure if it's a monthly fee or a yearly fee to enable yourself the ability to do private repositories so that's just something to keep in mind another key feature of bitbucket is that they offer a service for downloading files from your repository which my understanding is the uh, github um, site has stopped doing that and i believe uh, ehua uh, just uh kind of blogged about that like last year when he was working with his uh, knitter repository so i think that feature might be something to keep in mind if you're thinking about bitbucket as well now for me i've I've used GitHub a lot more, so I'm more familiar with that. But I'm actually going to look at using Bitbucket as well, maybe for similar projects or maybe even doing multiple. I should say if I wanted to mirror projects on both GitHub and on Bitbucket, you know, just to be extra cautious perhaps, you know, that might be an option too. Now, the good news is that you'll be able to interact with remote repositories quite easily. Um, with, with um, you know, R Studio or even the command line in general, the key is that you need to get set up with that um, particular you know site. And both GitHub and Bitbucket have great uh, tutorials or documentation for getting your remote repository set up. So I would, I'm not going to repeat those here because it, it would take a long time. And but I think their documentation does a better job in explaining it than I would without, of course, doing a real demonstration of it. But once you get set up with that, it's very easy from within our studio itself to basically push your repository up online, and you can do that within the R Studio interface. And then and from the command line, it's a very straightforward command as well. It's git, and then the word push, and then you put origin, and then space master. And that's simply explaining that you're pushing these uh, this updated repository to your master branch that's stored online. So that's what I have to do whenever I put some new code on, on GitHub with respect to, say, the NHL analysis project. I'm pushing that from our studio up into, un, into the Git, uh, GitHub repository, and that's what you see online. But... It's up to you to decide how often you do that push or how little you do it. It's totally up to you. But of course, until you actually do that, your changes are only seen by you yourself on your local machine. You'll have to think about sharing on a remote repository if you want others to see it as well. But I think another big advantage of remote repositories is the fact that, say, in a collaboration, you're working with multiple people. It's a very easy way for you to avoid having to, say, email files back and forth with each other. You Both of you can interact with the remote repository and upload your changes or put your changes there and have them merge for multiple users in a streamlined fashion. And Git makes that process of merging quite easily. And that's certainly something I'd be happy to explore later on if there's enough interest. But that's that's kind of what I wanted to mention with remote repositories. I think, again, it's a great and important tool for not only backing up your code files off of like your local computer, but also with respect to collaboration, whether it's a, a team working on a project itself or if you're creating, like, say, an R package or, you know, a, an interesting analysis and you want users around the world to take a look and have a streamlined way of, uh, you know, adding issues or, you know, thoughts on your analysis via these uh, these uh, sites like GitHub or Bitbucket. I think that's a really innovative feature that they offer, and I would highly recommend it. So, yes, that's been quite an introduction to Git. Um, we definitely covered a lot, but I would definitely invite you to check out the show notes where I have uh, links to not only that uh, that free uh, textbook I, I mentioned, Pro Git, but also some interesting blogs and blog posts and links from Stack Overflow on how other users are using Git and how specifically some you our users like us are using Git as well. So I'd highly recommend you uh, check that out. So that's going to close up the main topic for today. Let's next get to 
some uh, long-awaited listener feedback. Message for you, son. So as you might imagine, we have a big batch of listener feedback here, and I I might not be able to get to all of it today, but I'm definitely going to get to hopefully a good chunk of it from our uh, extended absence. And first, I have some uh, some plugs and some uh, thank yous to send out. So first of all, I want to say thank you very much to Randall, who was very kind enough to send our first ever our podcast donation. And that was a very nice gesture, and I want to thank you very much, Randall. And if you're interested in providing a donation as well, go ahead and check out our home site for the R Podcast, where you'll see on the main homepage um, a link to our uh, PayPal donation uh, interface. Go ahead and click that, and you'll be all set to go if you choose to make a donation to us. And those are highly appreciated, and they are you know, very nice to have, especially to you know, keep up with the bandwidth costs and the cost of maintaining the site. It's very nice to have. So I want to thank you again, uh, Randall, for doing that. And next, I want to give a couple shout outs here and a couple plugs. First of all, um, a listener, Daniel, had sent me links uh, a couple months ago to uh, another uh, free online course uh, portal called the Open Education Database. I'll have a link to it in the show notes, but what's nice is they're kind of aggregating some of these uh, courses from around the world, say, that are offered at universities, etc., that are, you know, open web online courses. And you can navigate to find, say, you know, statistics courses. You just have to go to the math category, but then you'll see a bunch of university uh, courses on statistics that are free of charge and, you know, ready for you to to learn at your leisure. So my hope is that they'll also have some links to some R specific courses in the future, but I think it's a, certainly something worth checking out. So thanks again, Daniel, for uh, passing that along my way. And I think that's a nice companion to the uh, one that's been getting a lot of buzz lately called uh, Coursera, which uh, just recently had their uh, data analysis course uh, wrap up, which I wish I was able to take in real time. I had signed up for it, but with all the things going on in my life, I didn't have time to really do it, you know, learn along the way. But I, I definitely was uh, keeping a watch of it from afar, and it looked like it was a really nice course. So I hope uh, they offer that again in the near future. Next, I want to give a plug to the uh, Statistics blog, which is found at statisticsblog.com. And one of the authors of Liz uh, sent me a link to that a couple weeks ago. And this site is a really nice survey of how to do uh, Monte Carlo simulations with R, as well as they touch on a lot of philosophical issues on statistics in general. Well, I think it's an interesting read for sure. And I've included that in the uh, blog role of all the kind of R blogs I keep up with. And you can find that on the home site r-podcast.org and you can kind of keep cheap track of what I'm linking to there as well. So I got a link to the uh, statistics blog there and uh, thanks again Liz for passing that along. So next um, we're going to dive into some feedback and um, Kevin wrote in and said I enjoyed your video on ggplot. Keep up the good work. So that's just a short and sweet message so thanks a lot Kevin and um you can look forward to more screencasts in the near future. Now do I have the uh, the new R Podcast laptop, if you will, up and running, which has enough horsepower to do the screencasts and then some. So I'm really looking forward to diving back into that. Next, we're gonna, we have a message from Aaron about some future topics. So Aaron writes, Eric, still loving your R Podcast. Are you planning to do anything on big data and parallel processing Hadoop, etc. Best Aaron. P.S. Your music choice is the best. Together with your personality, it gives a whole podcast a quirky and amiable character that I really appreciate when I'm out running with my iPod. <laughs> thanks a lot, Aaron. And um, yeah, thanks for those kind words. Um, those of you who have been listening from the beginning and probably seen a pattern with my music choice, and I'll uh, leave that up to you to figure that out if you haven't already. But yeah, I tend to have a bit of a eclectic taste, if you will, but it's it's all, you know, that's the stuff I listen to actually when I'm 
coding away on R, especially at work. It helps uh, keep me focused. That's uh, what keeps me going. So I'm glad you're enjoying that. So back to your uh, request. So yeah, I think those are um, very important topics that are going to fall right in place when I eventually cover um, high performance computing with R. Because as we know, we're in this uh, the world today where data is everywhere and the size of it's absolutely massive. So, you know, the nice thing about R is for the use of add-on packages, there are a lot of ways we can interact with data that are in complex and high dimensional databases or from online as well. And I'm going to cover all those uh, important topics in a future episode. So I have, I have that on the uh, future topic list and I will definitely uh, be happy to address that. And just to um, give you a preview, I have just begun reading a new book I bought um, called Parallel R, which has some really nice uh, introductions and examples of how to do some of the various uh, high performance computing uh, kind of capabilities with R itself. And I'll be kind of using that as a reference as I go along. And I think um, that would be uh, an interesting reference for you as well if you're interested in learning more about the topic. Next, I'm going to get to some feedback that was submitted on our contact page, which you can get to by going to our home site. Once again, uh, r-podcast.org. Go ahead and click the contact button at the top, and then you'll see a form where you can submit your questions, and it'll be directly uh, delivered to me. And no, it's a very quick and automated way of doing that. So, uh, um, Eric, appropriate enough, not me, but another Eric, uh, writes in and says, Thanks for an informative and interesting podcast. I have learned R alone by reading in the internet and being able to hear an actual voice is a refreshing experience. I'm catching up with past uh, podcast episodes and I have completed only three of them. However, I have a few questions about data structures. Some data aggregation functions return a table class that I don't know how to use other than printing it. Therefore, I have avoided them in favor of other functions like those in the plier package. I have also read things about data.table regarding it being a newer slash better alternative to data frames. Can you talk to us about those two, da those two data structures? Thanks, Eric. So, yeah, thanks, Eric. Yeah, <laughs> double thanks there. Um, but anyway... The table data structure, that's really meant for what I'll, what we call a categorical data analysis. So the date, the table structure itself is representing what some might call a contingency table, where you have basically counts summarizing the different combinations of, say, grouping variables. So maybe, for example, you have a table where it has as one of the groups gender, and another uh, grouping for like, say, grade level in like high school. So, you know, in that case, you might summarize all the students that are male and taking ninth grade courses or female and taking 10th grade courses. So all those six combinations are going to be represented in this, say, uh, two by three table of these uh, counts and number of students. So the table structure in R is meant for all these analyses you might do that are tailored to categorical analysis. For example, a well-known test is the uh, chi-square test of independence between, say, sets of factors, in this case, maybe gender and grade level. But there are many, many other methods that employ this, such as uh, log linear models, measures of association, even visualization of some uh, categorical data. And R has functions both built in and through some add-on packages that are using the table structure as like the input into those functions. So these functions, say for the chi-square test, are optimized for the table uh, type of object. So really, other than categorical analysis, I personally don't use the table structure very much. So unless you're doing that type of analysis, you probably don't need to really interact with it unless, you, like I said, you are doing some version of categorical analysis in which the functions you're interested in using require the table structure by default. 
Now, regarding the data.table uh, structure, so this comes from, as you may already know, the data.table package. And it's, from what I've read about it, and I've only used it very briefly, but I believe it's meant to be kind of an optimized version of data frames that are ideal for large data sets that you want to sort or join together by certain grouping variables, or you might call key variables. Now, I've heard and I've read online and I've even seen firsthand that if you have a large data set and you're doing something in a kind of a group-wise fashion, it's actually, I've seen a lot better run times and execution times of storing this original data as a data.table object and using its customized functions to do some kind of group processing. I've seen you know, cases where that runtime is greatly optimized as compared to using a data.frame version of that same data set. Now, the author of data.table cautions that it may not work for everything, but I would invite you to check out the uh, package vignettes that the author has made, which can be found directly on the data.table CRAN page, which I'll link to in the show notes where you can read more about kind of a, a nice introduction to data.table, as well as he has a nice FAQ document and some other kind of metrics on performance time in some situations. So I would recommend you check that out if you're interested in, you, let's say you have the situation of some large data sets that you're looking to get better performance out of, that might be a good fit. But um Admittedly, I'd like to explore this a little more. I haven't had the chance to other than very briefly over a year ago, but I think um, it's a very promising package, and he has uh, done a lot of work with the documentation, and I hear um, he's very active with answering questions from a support level, so I would invite you to check that out. So our last uh, feedback comes from Adam, who writes in and says, I just want to say how much I appreciate what you're doing with the R podcast. I have recently learned about R through a Coursera course, and I think it is amazing. And one of the best, most amazing things about, about it is how great the community is about sharing knowledge. I just listened to your podcast on workflow, and I'm eager to try it out, to try out the project template. Two areas in particular I'm eager to learn more about. Text mining. I'm working on a project where I have about 30,000 customer emails, and I'm trying to use R to answer questions like, what topics are customers emailing about? I've started using the topic models package, but I know there is a lot for me to learn about how to do this right. Second, how to scope out and plan an R project. I know your great podcast on workflow is a great starting point, but as a somewhat newbie programmer and definitely R newbie, I would love to hear some tips on how you scope out, uh, how to scope out a project and not get bogged down. Thanks again for the great service you are providing to the R community. Uh, well, thanks a lot, Adam. That's a, a excellent feedback. And you know, I, I I mentioned kind of in passing with the the mention of that uh, open course uh, site that Coursera has really gotten a lot of attention lately and. They had an excellent course, as, as you know, on the uh, computing for data analysis, which made heavy use of R. And um, I, I wasn't able to take it in real time, but it had some really nice uh, lectures, some really nice examples there. So I would recommend all of you check that out if you haven't already. I thought it was a really interesting course. Now, with respect to the text mining, I will be the first to admit I am almost brand new to this. But I think um, things you might want to look into, as you mentioned, the topic models package, I think is, is a nice package from what I've heard of. Um, I think with text mining, you might want to also kind of keep an eye out on the various uh, machine learning algorithms that are out there, because that might be a very important thing to, to think about as well. And there's some, there's some great R packages for machine learning one of which is called the carrot package, which kind of integrates all of these together. Now, again, I'm not sure if you can directly use these with text mining, but in a situation where you have a bunch of data, like you said, about 30,000 emails, and you're trying to kind of make sense of it, and like you said, trying to figure out what topics these uh, customers are emailing about, I think um, 
you might want to keep an eye on just kind of general machine learning uh, area as maybe some starting points as you get to know this field. But I think uh, text mining is becoming very uh, important lately. And I believe there's another textbook that's been released that talks about, I think it's called Machine Learning for Hackers. And it's uh, made by actually the author of um, the, uh, um, sorry, I'm tripping on words here. It's one of the authors is the author of the Project Template Package of John Miles White, as well as Drew Conway, who's a, also a very um, nice uh, and published author as well. Um, this might be an interesting book for you to check out as well, because they might have situations where they're looking at emails and things like that. I've actually uh, gotten the e the EPUB version of this, and I haven't had a chance to read it yet. But they may have some topics that might be geared to what you're doing as well. So I, you might want to check that out if you're interested. And regarding the scoping out an, an R project, so you're you're right in that it it's you want to know where to start where I would say you really want to break your project into different steps and this is where the project template package I think does a nice job of because in a in a typical analysis of course you have to go through all the stages of of course obtaining your data and then when you obtain your data most likely you're gonna to have to clean it up somehow right so that's what we call munging or pre-processing that itself can take a bit of work but I would kind of take this step by step. I would start by figuring out what is your source data, of course, and then what what concepts you need to keep in mind for uh, cleaning that up. Like how messy is it and what tools do you think you'll need to do that? Once you kind of itemize this list of what are the operations you need to work on to get the data ready, then you can start exploring like the various uh, resources online for R using, of course, say, the handy rseq.org uh, search engine, figure out what you need to do for certain things. Like, if you need to recode a variable, figure out what packages or code can help with that. If you need to do some, you know, aggregating or summarizing, what do you need to do for that? And I would take a step-by-step. -step. I would start with the processing stage, and then I would start with, of course, what are the goals of your project once you get your data ready to go? What are the answers you're trying to, to show or trying to, to get, if you will? And that will, of course, determine what methodologies you need to implement. And then you can explore whether R itself has them included by default or if you should tap into some of the various add-on packages that will help you accomplish whatever your analysis method entails. And then once you've, you've thought about that, then uh, make some careful consideration in how you want to present the results. Because whether you're doing this for yourself or you want to share this out in the open, say, on one of those uh, repositories I talked about, or if you're doing this for a client, or of course, how they want to see it is, of course, what you'll need to tailor it to. Then you want to think about what are the mechanisms you should to use for summarizing the results. Do you want it in a specific table? Do you want to put this in a like a PDF document? How do you want some visualizations with it? And really think about what you want to show. And then of course, figure out in R, how do you want to do that? So from visualization, of course, the ggplot2 package is my go-to package for making almost any type of graph. And from a reporting standpoint, what you'll hear about in the upcoming season, or this season, I should say, is how we can use the knitter package to create some really interesting reproducible reports that will you know help you convey the key message of your analysis result and also make it reproducible for when you need to rerun things so i think my key takeaway here is break this up into the stages of the analysis and then kind of hit them one by one and figure out what do you need to accomplish each of the tasks within those stages I think then you'll be more than you'll be more than ready to scope out this project and take it step by step instead of trying to do everything at once. Take this in a step by step approach, and I think you'll be uh, good to go, if you will. So I'll be interested to see how it goes for you, Adam, and definitely keep me posted if there's any other concepts you'd like me to explore on the show. 
So again, if I didn't get to your feedback, uh, my my apologies. I will definitely get back on that. But thanks again for for passing that along. And just uh, reiterate, the easiest way to contact me is by through the uh, contact page on the r-podcast.org site. Just go ahead and click the contact button, or you can always send an email to the rcast at gmail.com. And that's another great way to get feedback as well. So we're going to close out the show with a couple additional uh, segments, the first of which is the R Community Roundup. All right, so you can imagine in the time away from the R podcast and our layoff that a lot of things have happened in the community. Now, I obviously I couldn't get to all of them here, but I want to highlight a couple of things I I saw recently on the various uh, R blogosphere that really caught my eye. So one of which is an interesting post um, from uh, Rodriguez on uh, Rodriguez uh, Smith and. He did a nice uh, visualization on looking at the season performance of the NCAA tournament teams. And you'll notice what he's done here is he's made the visualizations of what looks like a ggplot2. But he's also done this through kind of a web interface where you can select what teams you want on the left and right side of the graphs. And within each of these graphs are box plots with each uh, plot being a player on the team and their points scored, for example. But you could also configure what the y-axis actually is. So it might be points scored, it might be rebounds, things like that. But I was thinking to myself, what an interesting way to visualize a performance. And I'll be honest, I'm definitely going to think about implementing something similar with the NHL data that I've aggregated so far and maybe doing some various uh, visualizations around that. But he's, um, I'll link to his uh, blog post on, on the show notes. Uh, I, I should say uh, uh, the proper way to pronounce his name is Rodrigo Zanith. My apologies for butchering the name at first. But he's uh, he's made the, the code available online through, appropriate enough, a GitHub repository. And he's using a combination of Python and R to accomplish uh, this uh, visualization. So... I think this is something I need to take note of is that it's really nice to kind of have some multiple toolboxes in your arsenal as you attack an analysis, whether it's with R itself and the various packages within it or using something like Python to help scrape the data and clean things up before you get to R. I think the more you can do to make your life easier, the better. And if that means using some multiple tools for the job, well, yeah, I'd say more power to you. Go right to it. So I thought it was a really interesting post, and I definitely recommend you check that out. And, of course, I'll have a link to it in the show notes. Another uh, post I want to close out the segment with is uh, a post about how you can plot and visualize the results from a linear model and a general linear model with the ggplot2 package. And this is from an author... Oh man, I'm going to pronounce his name. Uh, I pronounce his name very badly here. For Rothenlicht, I don't know if it's German or I, I'm sure it's European, but I just don't really know the, the name uh, to pronounce it very well. Um, but uh, actually, yeah, I don't think that was his name. Uh, Daniel Ludtek. Well, in any in any event, I'm so sorry for butchering your name, but I'll have a link to your blog post where he's got some interesting code along with examples of visualizing kind of the various results of like a linear model fit for the various uh, terms in your model, whether it's a, you know, in other words, the beta coefficients associated with a particular model term and how you can visualize the standard errors around with the actual beta estimate and kind of get a range of how that effect size is with respect to the length of that interval, if you will. And I think it's a really nice visualization to get kind of take a look at the model performance of, uh, of a, say, a linear model through the use of ggplot2. 
He's also done this with uh, some uh, categorical models as well by putting in kind of odds of ratio performance uh, estimates as well. And so that's a really nice thing to see is how your model is performing with respect to these factors and the odds ratio estimates. So I just thought it was a really neat application of ggplot2 to visualize our model results. And it's certainly something I'm going to take a look at and see if I can adapt that some of some of my models using ggplot2 um, to visualize, say, a regression fit or a linear model fit or a categorical model fit. I think there's some really interesting ideas there. And so he's sharing his code on his own site where you can go ahead and download the files and, and check them out. So I highly recommend that as well. Um, so lastly, let's uh, close out our, these segments with our um, package pick. <laughs> So the package I'm going to highlight to wrap up today's episode doesn't have anything to do with version control, but it does have you know, very um, interesting implications for the future uh, episodes of this season. This package is called Reports. Reports is a package that aims to give a nice way of integrating the Knitter package, the Markdown package, as well as the Pandoc utility of creating reproducible and integrated uh, report templates. So I, I, could, I could speak a lot more of it, but I wanna point you to the blog post that introduces the reports package from the Trinkers uh, blog. And he has uh, made a nice introductory screencast for one of the, the, the basic usage of the reports package. And I'm really interested in this because it, it does a nice way of launching say a template file for making your specific R markdown or R sweep file and giving you kind of the template in place for you to go ahead and start putting your results in and then being able to tie in the knitter package to compile it to an output of interest, whether it's a PDF or et cetera, but then putting in Pandoc, the utility that basically is like a Swiss army knife of, uh, document conversions to, to, to convert that to maybe a Microsoft Word document and you know another any other type of document an HTML report some HTML slides it's a really nice integration of all those tools together and I've only briefly started exploring it but I would definitely recommend you guys check that out and we'll probably be mentioning it once again in the future episodes of this season but it's kind of highlighting this uh, recent boon in, in activity with the R community regarding reproducible research and reproducible analysis where the knitter pack just kind of started this domino effect of all these things kind of coming together at once and additional resources from the community being built. And in this case, another R package to make this process very easy with tools that are freely available. So it's just really kind of interesting to see all this uh, come about. So this has been a jam-packed episode, um, but we're going to go ahead and kind of close up shop here. So as always, I invite you to go ahead and check out the main site, www.r-podcast.org, and you'll see the show notes, episode downloads, of course, the RSS feeds to keep up with new episodes as they're made available the various R resources I've, I've made available online that I've found helpful. And coming up in the future, we will have specific articles that are diving deep into additional topics. You can also get updates on when the shows are available on our Twitter account. That is at the RCast. Also, we are on Google Plus, where we also post the uh, episodes as well. So we have links to the main page. And we have a friendly URL for this. It's uh, gplus.to slash the rcast. And we'll have a direct link to that in the show notes. And of course, as I mentioned, you can interact with the show multiple ways. For getting feedback to us, of course, please use the contact page on our home site or send us an email with the rcast at gmail.com. And um, also feel free to leave us an audio comment through either an audio attachment that you record and send to us via email, 
or use our voicemail hotline at plus one two six nine eight four nine nine seven eight zero. And also, we recently launched the uh, R Podcast subreddit at links.r-podcast.org, where I put kind of links to the various uh, resources and and key uh, community updates on on the on the subreddit. And if you'd like to leave feedback there, I'm more than happy to see that. So, with that, this is this concludes episode 12 of the R Podcast. Once again, it's great to be back. And until next time. End of line.